have two readings this morning. The first is from Psalm 119, verse 15, and that reads, I meditate on your precepts and consider your ways. And next from Mark chapter 14, verses 22 to 20. I was only going to go to 24, right? I had marked more than that in my Bible. Uh, While they were eating, Jesus took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, this is my body. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and offered it to them, and they all drank from it. Which is poured out for many. He said to them, I will... Oh, that's where I was going to stop. This is the blood of my covenant, which is poured out for many. Um, This is the last week in our series. We've been uh, looking at this series, Be Still. And I don't know about you, but I really enjoyed this series. It's it's been, uh, I I think it's been pretty good. And we've been talking about some different ways that we can experience rest, that we can truly experience uh, both spiritual and physical rest. Uh, If you remember that first week in the series, we looked at the necessity of, of finding Times of silence, uh, finding times to just get away from everything and, and just be with God. Give us an opportunity to hear from God. Uh, silence can be a little uncomfortable, but it's also necessary, that practice of silence, the discipline of silence, to really get away so we can, we can put ourselves in a position where, where we can hear from God, to make a huge difference in our closeness with God. The second week, we we looked at at how we can find peace. And we saw that Jesus often slipped away to to be alone, to pray, uh, to find that silence with God. We looked at some practical steps, how we can kind of recreate a time of of silence and and, and rest and getting away for prayer. Uh, We talked about um, starting a discipline of, of Bible reading, devotion, and prayer during a scheduled quiet time each day. Then last week, we began to look at the idea of finding rest. And we talked about, mostly about Sabbath rest, really. We talked about finding a day a week when we can just take off and just kind of be a little bit more quiet and, and rest a little bit more. We're not under the law, so we're not required by law to do this Sabbath. Um, but a, a spiritual discipline of a day of rest can be very helpful. Um, and we talked about some of those practical steps at, at turning off our phones and our, our gadgets that, that distract us and get in our way. And after service, I found out which four or five of you don't have a smartphone yet. <laughs> kind of interesting. It was only 12 years since the smartphone came on. And, and, and already in just 12 years... Over 90% of our group here has a smartphone, so it's uh, incredible. Today we're going to continue that idea of rest. I've got a few more practical steps, a couple of disciplines that you might want to try to help you experience rest. And I think they help more with spiritual rest than physical rest. But, you know, our physical and our spiritual are very closely related. Uh, If you're spiritually exhausted, you feel physically exhausted, don't you? And the same is true if we're spiritually refreshed and energized, we feel physically refreshed as well. So here's a few practical disciplines you might, you might wish to uh, try to incorporate into your schedule. And the first is to start the practice of meditation. Start the practice of meditation. In the first reading in, in verse one, uh, Psalm 119, it says, I meditate on your precepts, and consider your ways. Precepts uh, really means law or commands. Um, The Israelites were instructed over and over and over again to meditate on God's law. That was a very basic part of what they were supposed to do every day. Spend time every day meditating on God's law. Psalm 1 is talking about a blessed man, a man who who does not stand in the way of sinners. And by that, I don't mean he, he gets in front of them and stands in their way. He doesn't try to stop them from doing what they're doing. He just doesn't go where they go. He just avoids their way. He, he lets them go and he goes the other way. Well, that man is blessed. In verse 2, it says, His delight is in the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. 
Now, we're not under the law. Both of those two verses say that we meditate on the law, but we're not under the law, right? We're under a new covenant of faith in Jesus Christ. And as we try to follow Jesus Christ, we meditate, we try to follow uh, his grace and love and mercy. And if we can take some time to reflect on, to meditate on his grace and mercy and love in our lives, that can be an invaluable practice. Um, in 1 Timothy uh, chapter 4, verse 11, it says, Command and teach these things, set an example for the believers in speech, in life, in love, in faith, in purity. Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture, to preaching and teaching. Do not neglect your gift, which was given you through a prophetic message when the body of the elders laid their hands on you. Be diligent in these matters. Give yourselves wholly to them so that everyone may see your progress. Now, it doesn't actually say meditate in that verse, but I think that idea of, of, of being diligent in those matters and, and giving yourselves wholly to them, I, I think he's instructing Timothy to think about these things. Think about what I'm telling you to do. Meditate on these things that I'm telling you to do, and others will see your progress. Richard Foster, in his book, Celebration of Discipline, starts out his chapter on meditation by saying, in contemporary society, our adversary majors in three things. Noise, hurry, and crowds. That seems true, doesn't it? If he can keep us engaged in muchness and manyness, he will rest satisfied. He doesn't want us meditating because meditating brings us closer to God and he doesn't want that. So he tries to keep us busy, tries to keep us distracted so we don't have time to meditate. Psychiatrist Carl Jung once remarked, hurry is not of the devil, it is the devil. We've been talking about finding silence and solitude and how hard it can be because society is just so busy. There's just always so much going on. It's hard to find the time. Um, But that's not of God. That's of the devil. That's how the devil does things. Just wants to keep us distracted so we can't get too close to God. And if we're busy all the time, especially if we're trying to be busy all the time because it makes us look important or something like that, but if we're busy all the time, then we're falling right into the devil's trap. To be with God, we need to put busyness behind us. And that's the reason for this series. That's why we've been talking about these things for the last four weeks. Um, We've got to get quiet and get close to God. And the practice of meditation helps us do that. Rick Warren, in his book, Purpose Driven Life, had a chapter, I think a whole section on meditation. And I'll never forget, he he wrote that... um, that meditation is just thinking about something over and over again. If you worry, you already do that. So if you worry, you know how to meditate. We just have to change what we're thinking about to make it positive. We need to think about God instead of thinking about all those things that might go wrong. But if you know how to, I love that, if you, know, if you worry, you know how to meditate. You just think about God and what God can do in that situation. Looking at the Old Testament, if If you look at the life of Isaac and Moses and and Eli and Samuel and Elijah and Isaiah, Jeremiah, you'll see a common thread through all of those things. God didn't speak to those people because they were mighty men with special abilities. He spoke to them because they were willing to listen. And in meditation, we show God a willingness to listen. Christian meditation is very simply the ability to hear God's voice and obey. In in meditation, we quiet ourselves. We think about things of God. We might meditate on a scripture or something so that we can hear from God. And then we obey whatever God tells us to do. Uh, in, In the book of Acts, both Stephen and Peter tell us that Jesus is the fulfillment of a prophecy in Deuteronomy 18, verse 5, which talks about the coming of a prophet who is like Moses, who will teach, and whom the people will hear and obey. 
fact, if you go through the book of Acts, you see a book full of people who hear and obey. The best news for us is that Jesus hasn't stopped speaking. And through meditation, we can hear. So meditation is a great spiritual discipline that I highly recommend. It's it's very worthwhile. And for me, at least, meditation and journaling kind of go hand in hand. Because in meditation, God can speak to you. And in journaling, you can write down what he says before you forget. Because let's face it, if you're anything like me, five minutes after you put the book away, you can't remember what insight you might have had. So I think meditation and journaling kind of go hand in hand. Um, So pick a scripture verse, think about it, reflect on it, meditate on it, and then write down what you hear from it. Um, The second spiritual discipline I want to throw out here is something that you probably won't hear about in any of your, if you get a book on spiritual disciplines, you probably won't hear this anywhere. Uh, But it's pretty simple, and it's, it's sharing meals with friends. <clears throat> Somehow I skipped a verse from... Can you put that verse from Revelation up there? That last verse, that last passage there? There it is. I skipped over that somehow. Sorry about that. But Revelation 3.20 says, I, Here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. Jesus wants to know you. He wants you to come to him. And I think that door that separates us from Jesus is is sin. And he's knocking on that door, and he wants us to repent from sin so that he can enter in, right? Meditation is one of the ways that we can, once we've repented, is one of those ways we can get closer with God. Um, I got all messed up. Here we go. Sharing meals in the New Testament. You ever notice how many times Jesus shared a meal with somebody? Quite often. And and we're going to look at several examples here in a minute. But sharing meals is is almost like an intimate activity. It's almost we get very close to people as we share a meal with somebody. We can build fantastic communication, which leads to building community which leads to close relationships. Um, it, it seems I've harped on the, uh, on the disadvantages, I guess, of, of cell phones and tablets and all these little gadgets that we have that keep us from really communicating with each other. It seems I've talked about that every week. But, but those things, as we text more and instant message more and Instagram more, we have less and less face-to-face communication. And as a result... Our relationships are deteriorating. Our community is deteriorating. Our sense of community, I should say, is deteriorating. We don't have those close relationships anymore. You don't form close relationships with a text, even a series of texts. They're formed best and fastest in face-to-face communication. Um, Real, caring relationships are formed in face-to-face relationships. And because we spend so much less time face-to-face and so much more time on Instagram and Facebook, these things are are more and more fragmented. It it seems we can communicate with people all day long without ever forming communication or community, without ever really building communication and and relationships that last. Uh, And for Jesus, sharing a meal with somebody was a great way to communicate with them. Um, it was a great place for him to share the, ne- the necessity to repent as well. It was a great way to, for him to share uh, his purpose for being there. Remember, he even ate with sinners, right? And I want to look at a couple of uh, examples of that. In Luke chapter 5, we see an example when Jesus ate with sinners. He had just called Levi to come follow me. Levi was a tax collector, also known as Matthew, the writer of the first gospel. Um, and, and right after Levi called him, Levi invited Jesus to supper and, and had a big banquet. And, and it says in verse, uh, I'm not sure what verse, it's up there, right? 
Um, Levi held a great banquet for Jesus at his house, and a large crowd of tax collectors and others were eating with them. But the Pharisees and teachers of the law who belonged to their sect complained to his disciples, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus answered them, It's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I've not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. A lot of you may remember that verse, but it came in the context of a shared meal together. And one of the ways Jesus did that, sharing repentance with people, was was in the course of sharing a meal with them. If you remember, it was in the home of Simon the Pharisee during a shared meal that Jesus was anointed by a woman with perfume. Jesus ate at the home of Mary and Martha several times, shared meals on a regular basis. In Luke 14, verse 1, Jesus again at the home of a Pharisee on the Sabbath, and and all these other Pharisees are gathered around, and they're watching Jesus to see how he's going to react because they're trying to set him up a little bit. And and we see, uh, starting in verse 2, there in front of him was a man suffering from dropsy. Jesus asked the Pharisees and experts of the law, is it, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they remained silent. So taking hold of the man's arm, he healed him and sent him on his way. Well, there's a debate on following the law and healing people on the Sabbath that followed that. But the whole incident took place in the context of sharing a meal together. And don't forget our reading, our second reading in Mark, that Jesus spent his last night with his disciples sharing a meal. It was a Passover meal. But Jesus, again, shared a meal with them. And we'll remember that as we gather at the table here at the end of service. Um, we heard a little bit about what went on there in our reading in Mark. Jesus spent a lot of time sharing meals with people. And that's uh, another I was reminded of on Monday night. We had our Monday night class on preaching. This last Monday night was our last night. And there was a lady there. There there was only one of the students in the group was actually preaching at this point. And she's doing an interim uh, filling in for pulpit supply. And and she's been doing this series on Paul and, and his journeys. And in her message, she mentioned Aquila and Priscilla, and something connected with me in that. And I thought that's a, another great example of sharing meals that, that we can all do. In Acts chapter 19, Paul meets Aquila and Priscilla in Corinth. They travel to Antioch. Paul stays there a few weeks, maybe a little bit more, we don't really know. And then he moves on. But Aquila and Priscilla stay there. And a few weeks later, or sometime later, Apollos comes to Antioch to preach. And it says of, of Apollos, it says he was a learned man with a, thorough under, with a thorough knowledge of scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and he spoke with great fervor and taught about Jesus accurately, though he knew only the baptism of John. Now, let's stop here for a second and think about that. What is the baptism of John? It's a baptism of repentance, right? John preached, repent now. For one is coming who is greater than I. Repent now, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So John's baptism was a repentance of uh, was a baptism of repentance. Jesus' baptism is a baptism of the Holy Spirit, right? When we're baptized into the God the Father, Jesus the Son, and, and the Holy Spirit, we receive the Holy Spirit, right? So I'm reading into this that, that Apollos was maybe a very learned man, ha- had learned a lot about Jesus but didn't have the Holy Spirit. And he comes to Antioch and he's preaching and Priscilla and Aquila begin to discern this. And and it says in verse 26, when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they invited him to their home and explained to him the way of God more adequately. And I don't think I'm reading too much into this to say that when they invited him into their home, they invited him into their home for a meal, right? They most likely shared a, a dinner with him. They had him over for dinner, and during the dinner conversation, they spoke to him and told him what his ministry was lacking and shared with him. And and again, it doesn't say this, but somewhere along the line, Apollos received the Holy Spirit. I don't know if if Aquila and uh, 
And Priscilla laid hands on him and prayed for him, or maybe he was rebaptized in the name of Jesus. We don't know. But, but the next verse, verse 27, says, When Apollos wanted to go to, to Achaia, the brothers encouraged him and wrote to the disciples there to welcome him. Why were they so eager to welcome him, to, to uh, recommend him? Because he was ready now. He was filled with the Holy Spirit. And what he may have lacked before has been made complete. He was ready. So, so far we've seen in our message, we've seen the, the value of meditation and, and how we can uh, begin to meditate. And, and we've heard about sharing meals with others and how that can build community and, and we can find rest in that community. The third one is to partake in communion. We saw in Mark that when Jesus shared the Passover meal with his disciples on the night of his arrest, and, and we'll gather again, we'll gather at the table here in just a few minutes. Um, but when we do that, when we gather at the table for communion, a necessary part of that is to quiet ourselves at the table, to think, to reflect on what Jesus did for us. We think about God's redemptive love for each one of us through Jesus Christ. We think about Jesus' promise to come again. Uh, a necessary part of that is to still our hearts and to reflect on, on who Jesus really was. So, so we're going to have that opportunity here in just a few minutes to do that. Um, in Acts 2.42, this is another of my, I have a lot of favorite verses in the book of Acts. Uh, Acts 2.42 says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship to breaking of bread and to prayer. To me, that's Jesus Christ is the foundation. And, and they devoted themselves to, to apostles' teaching, which they didn't have a Bible yet, but basically, eventually, the apostles' teaching got written down and became our Bible, right? So they devoted themselves to the Bible, Bible study. They devoted themselves to fellowship, breaking of bread, and prayer. I think those are the four things that every church ought to be about, every believer ought to be about those four things. And, and those four things sit on the foundation of Jesus Christ. But uh, now talking about breaking bread there, that was most likely sharing a meal. At that time, they shared a meal together every time they gathered. And they had the fellowship around the meal. They had that. I don't know if they did at the beginning, if they did the communion part like we do at the beginning of the meal, I know that was the practice by about 120 A.D. when they wrote the book called the Didache, which is the teaching of the Twelve. It writes about the Eucharist, that you, uh, it gives some suggested prayers for the bread and for the cup. And, and then it says, when everybody has eaten their full, well, we're not going to eat our full of bread, right? They're talking about a shared meal. When everyone's eaten what they need for the meal, then you have a closing prayer. So they did communion as a way to kick off their shared meal. Somewhere after 120 AD, that idea of sharing a meal every time kind of was replaced by just the first part of that, just the communion part of that. And then somewhere from there, it came to uh, sharing communion every time we got together, and then finally it, it, it came to once a month as we do it today, or some churches don't even do it that often. The last church I was at only did it about five times a year. Uh, but communion is important. But the good news is you don't have to wait for us to do it here to have communion. There's nothing stopping us as Baptists to do communion at home. We can do it with our family during an evening meal. You don't need a priest or a minister. You don't have to have an ordained somebody to do communion for you. You can do it in your quiet time of devotion. You can do it any time you feel led to do it. You can do it with a group of friends or a small group. Communion adds an element of worship to, to whatever atmosphere you bring, you bring it to. Um, so we, we've learned the importance of meditation and, and sharing meals together and finally the, the importance of quieting our hearts at the table and sharing the elements of communion.
This brings us to a close in our series. Again, just remember that if... uh, I really like this series. If you really like this series too, we've packaged the, the thing together in the hallway. You can pick up a copy of it for friends or if you want to be reminded of what was said. And of course, the internet or Right Now Ministry also has opportunities to see it again. Um, let's pray as we close. Father God, we thank you, Father, for, for your word, uh, for your son, Jesus Christ, that is the foundation for all we do here. Uh, for our love of him, for our, our love for country, for all the loves that we have, uh, but most importantly for, uh, for the sacrifice that Jesus made on our behalf. As we gather at the table here in a few minutes, we, we remember that, and we ask, Father, for your grace and mercy as, as our hearts reflect on him. It's in his name we pray. Amen.